that once I met a man when I was oppressed by sin. He opened up his heart and he laid me in. Oh, he lifted me from wrong and set me on my way. so good, so good and strong, all I can say is Jesus, Jesus, you've been good, ever, ever, ever so good, yes, you've been good, so good, and so good to me. so good Lord you know that you've been good oh so good to me and let me tell you about this man he's been so good to me he's always by my side just like he said When I go weak and fall, he's always there to grab my hand. You choose your ground, but as for me, with him I'm gonna stand. With my Jesus and I know, Jesus, you've been never, ever, ever so Jesus, you've been good, ever, ever, ever so good. Jesus, you've been good to me. You've been good, ever so good. You've been good. Good evening, and welcome to the virtual gospel meeting here at the Sugarland Church of Christ in Sugarland, Texas. My name is Jimmy Holman, I'm a servant here at the Sugarland Church of Christ, and we thank you so much for carving off some time out of your schedule to be able to engage in this gospel effort. I want you to sit back this evening and just relax and enjoy the ride, and we'll be taking you on a, a gospel venture to show you those things that what thus says the Lord. And, Hopefully you'll be able to take these nuggets this evening and be able to put them into your life and you'll be able to be a better Christian going forward than maybe you've been in the past. At this time, we, we thank you. So we thank our, minute, our preacher who will be coming before us and um, Brother Mark Clay. We thank him so much for uh, agreeing to do this for us and he'll be introduced a little bit later on. But at this time, let us go to our Heavenly Father in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this day. Father, we thank you so much for all the benevolence that you've sent our way over our years. Father, thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, who you allowed to come down and die that shameful death upon the cross. Father, that we will have an avenue to be able to get back to you one day. Father, we thank you so much for allowing us to put this effort on this week. Father, we thank you for the ears in which are being or listen to that on this, this on this evening. Father, we pray that it will, will be received well. And Father, we will make changes in our lives based off the gospel. And Father, we pray that you will always be uh, with us as you said that you would. And Father, we'll have our faith in you and all that we do. In Jesus' name, amen. There are some things I may not know, and there are some places I, I can't go, I cannot go, but I am sure. 
is one thing, my God is real, for I can feel Him in my soul, yes God is real, He's so real in my soul. to the Sugarland Church of Christ. And this evening, I want to take the opportunity to thank you for tuning in to our virtual gospel meeting. This is the very first night. We're excited about this week. I hope that you are excited with us. And please get the opportunity, if you can, to tune in every single night. We have some excellent gospel preachers on this week. Also, we encourage you to share these messages from your Facebook page to your friends, to your loved ones, so that way others could hear the, the powerful gospel messages that are to be presented on this week. This evening, I have the distinct honor of introducing Brother Richard Barclay of the Stonecrest Church of Christ in Atlanta, Georgia. I don't know why y'all call me to introduce this man. This man don't even need no introduction, but I'm going to do it anyway. So Brother Barclay planted the Stonecrest Church of Christ. Well, he serves as a senior minister. He served as minister in congregations in Georgia and Texas and, and Massachusetts and California. He also led a radio ministry and TV program. He preached in South Africa. He preached in Ethiopia in his 30 plus years of service. He's also a highly sought after uh, keynote speaker at church lectureships all across the country. And he has preached in over 40 states in these United States. 
He's been a long-term supporter of Christian education. He was named director of the Southwestern Christian College Lectureship in 2017. Also, uh, he established an endowment to help support young men and young women to pursue higher Christian education. When he's not in the pulpit or ministering to the people of God, he enjoys reading and also he enjoys playing golf. He's married to his wife, Shirley Brooks Barclay, who is a former educator and counselor. They have two adult sons, Christopher and Reginald. Put your seatbelts on, Brother Barclay, wonderful gospel preacher. He's a preacher's preacher. He's a mentor and a wonderful man, wonderful gospel man, um, a preacher. So please, I ask you to put your seatbelt on because the voice that you're going to hear in just a couple minutes is that of Brother Richard Barclay from Stonecrest Church of Christ. Dr. Richard L. Barclay, I'm senior minister for the Stonecrest Church of Christ that's located in one of the suburbs of Atlanta, Georgia, called McDonough. Um, we are happy to be able to come and to share with you convictions about our Christ that are predicated upon what God has already said in his divinely inspired, inerrant, and infallible word of God. Let me appreciate your uh, minister, Lewis Parker, for uh, his invitation to share with one of the great churches of the Houston uh, area, the Sugar Land uh, Church of Christ. It's been my uh, privilege to be able to minister in this congregation uh, on a number of occasions. And let me thank uh, uh, Brother Parker for uh, his invitation to share uh, with you. 
Uh, it has been my privilege to work with him on a number of occasions when I was uh, a director of the lectureship there at Southwestern Christian College, and he has appeared uh, on it, and we appreciate uh, uh, his insight, uh, uh, his inspiration, uh, and his skills uh, to handle the Word of God. I would also extend invitation to a number of friends uh, of long standing in the congregation, as well as uh, the overseers uh, and the deacons. God bless uh, each uh, and every one of you. Now, uh, I want to talk to you uh, from this notion uh, that you will see the parallel for uh, my subject uh, at uh, uh, Ezra chapter 3, verses 10 through uh, 13. I want to talk to you uh, from this notion uh, why we need to preserve the past, uh, we also need to embrace the present. Now, if we would go back just to the very first graphic, uh, to a lot of young people in your audience, they have absolutely no frame of reference what that graphic is all about. Now, they may have seen it as some kind of decoration, uh, but for those of us who are over 50, uh, remember very well uh, this rotary phone with this uh, uh, long elastic cord. I'll get into that more uh, in a moment. But uh, it represents a relic from uh, the past. Now, this is what we, uh, for the most part, use today. Uh, this, uh, this mobile uh, cellular uh, phone. Uh, in that red phone, that was, for the most part, one phone per house. But in this uh, new technological age, everybody in the house uh, has one of these uh, devices. And it just kind of represents technologically where we are at present. But then look at the future. This uh, is what phones are going to look like uh, in the future. And, and church, what I'm trying to say to you is this. Whether you are ready for the future or not, the future is still coming. I remember as a child, we used to play this uh, little childlike uh, game where we would hide, uh, uh, we, we would count to a certain number and then the, uh, people would go out and hide. We called the game hide and seek. Uh, you count to a hundred, people would go out and hide and you were at home base and the object of the game was to uh, touch, you touch home base before uh, the person counting uh, if you did, then, of course, you were safe. If you didn't, then, of course, you were out. Uh, and, and at the end of his count, uh, he would say, ready or not, here I come with my BB eyes wide open. One of the things I'm trying to get across to you today is the future is coming. It is coming whether we are ready for the future or not. The future will either shape us. Or we will shape the future. And that choice is left up to us. Now, I want to take those three notions now and show you how they apply to a passage of Scripture uh, in the, the book of Ezra. And uh, you are studying that book uh, on this week. And I have the first three chapters uh, of the book. So uh, let me read uh, Ezra 3, verses 10 through 13. I'll explain the historical context for you in just a second. And when the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, they set the priests in their apparel. They all dressed up now uh, with their instruments. And the Levites, these were the men who led the worship of God out of the Old Testament and inside of the temple. And the Levites, the son of Asaph, with symbols to praise the Lord after the ordinance of David, the king of Israel. And they sang together by course. I wish I had an hour right there. Uh, because singing and styles of singing uh, have troubled the church in the last uh, 15 or 20 years. Uh, this is what we would call today antiphonal singing. But I don't have time to get into all of that because I certainly don't want to stir up uh, any kind of controversy here. Watch this. The text says uh, that they sang together by course in praising and giving thanks unto the Lord. Because he sure enough is good. For his mercy endureth uh, forever toward Israel. And watch the response of the people. When the foundation of the temple was being laid. 
the text says, and all the people shouted with a great shout when they praised the Lord because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. But look at two different responses to the laying of the foundation of, of the temple. Many of the priests and the Levites and chief of the fathers who were ancient men, okay? Uh, this is uh, an older generation. Look at their response to the laying of the foundation of the temple. When they saw the foundation being laid, these older generation had seen the first house. In other words, they'd seen the first temple. Well, where is it now? I'll explain to you in just a second. When the foundation of this house was laid before their eyes, they wept with a loud voice, and many shouted uh, aloud for joy, so that the people could not discern the noise of the shout of joy from the noise of the weeping uh, of the people. For the people shouted uh, with a loud shout, and the noise was heard uh, afar off. Oh, I hope you caught that. When the foundation of the temple was being laid, there were some people who had seen the first temple. When they saw the new foundation for the temple, because the first temple had already been destroyed, but when they saw the foundation being laid, the Bible said, while everybody is singing, while everybody is praising, while everybody is shouting, the response to what is being seen is different based upon, listen to this, the generations. The older folk were weeping, but the younger people were shouting. Why such different and divergent response? Well, in order to understand and appreciate the text, we need to look at the text in terms of its historical context. Now, while you are studying the book of Ezra uh, this week, you need to be mindful that uh, the book of Ezra and the book of Nehemiah are what we call twins. In other words, you have to read them together. They both talk about the same historical event from the vantage point of a rebuilding of the broken down walls, that's Nehemiah, and from Ezra who is the scribe, he will come when the walls are rebuilt, he will come and restore the temple. The walls have been broken down, Nehemiah, will repair and restore them. Ezra is going to restore the worship of the nation of Israel. This is what you need to appreciate. Ezra and Nehemiah are what we call in Old Testament uh, canon as post-exilic prophets, uh, post-exilic books. I don't understand that word, preacher. Okay, post-exile. Well, wait a minute. If you're talking about something that happened after exile, post, well, why in the world uh, were they ever in exile? Boy, y'all asking a good question. In 586 B.C., uh, Nebuchadnezzar, uh, who was king of Babylon, uh, had come and taken uh, the southern kingdom of Israel, uh, which is called Judah, into captivity. 722. Uh, the northern kingdom uh, had been taken uh, into captivity. But in our text, uh, Nebuchadnezzar uh, had uh, 70 years prior to the reading uh, of our text here, uh, had come and taken Judah into captivity. Listen to me carefully. They were in captivity for approximately 70 years. Now, when Babylonian captivity ended, 
not all of the Jews returned to Jerusalem. Nehemiah was one of those who, though free, chose to stay in Persia, uh, in Babylon. He was no longer a slave. They had been uh, released to go back uh, to their homeland. But Nehemiah was one of those who simply stayed. Uh, he had worked his way up uh, in the administration of Persia. Nehemiah 1.11 tells us that he is a cup bearer. Nehemiah 2.1 tells us that he is a cup bearer for a king by the name of Artaxerxes. He had gained favor with this king. Perhaps I should tell you what a cup bearer is. Well, uh, just turn the word around. He's a bearer of the cup. I know that didn't help you a whole lot. All right. Today, we would say that he worked for the secret service in our government. In our government, uh, there is a group of men and women whose job it is to lay their lines down for the protection of the president. Anybody shooting at the president, they're going to take that bullet. Anybody trying to pause on it, the president, then somebody is going to drink the cup. Somebody is going to eat the food before President Biden eats or drink anything because people are always trying to assassinate our president. But we have a group of trained men and women called the Secret Service, and one of their responsibilities is to protect the president in terms of what he eats and what he drinks and where he goes. Whenever the president goes anywhere, uh, the Secret Service uh, has already been there. They have scouted uh, out the route that he's going to take. They have examined the hotel where he is going to live. They have done extensive uh, evaluation upon the personnel uh, in the hotel because we need and always trying to protect the leader of the free world. Well, that is Nehemiah's job. Now, much like what happened when slavery occurred in the United States, uh, the Emancipation Proclamation uh, Act freed the slaves. Many of the slaves went to the north. Not all of the slaves went because the only life, the only occupation that some of our uh, ancestors knew was picking cotton and, and, and tobacco and farming. And so they simply stayed uh, on the farm. They were free people, but they continued in those jobs. Nehemiah was one of those. But then Ezra was also one of those. See, uh, Nehemiah led a delegation back to rebuild the walls, but Ezra is going to lead a delegation back to Jerusalem. Uh, I have Nehemiah on the screen. That's an error on my part. Ezra is going to lead uh, a delegation back to Jerusalem uh, to build uh, the walls, but Ezra the scribe will return and rebuild the house of the Lord. That is the temple. That's the context in which our reading takes place. So Ezra uh, is going to lead uh, men and women back to rebuild the temple. Nehemiah will lead people back to rebuild the walls. Ezra will lead people back to restore the spiritual worship and life uh, of the nation because for 70 years they have not been able to worship God accordingly. Now, I want you to watch this. Uh, so with that background in mind, look at this notion. Uh, you don't see many of these phones around. <laughs> uh, for those of us uh, who are about 50 and older, uh, we're, we're going to remember that rotary phone. Uh, in fact, some of you will remember even what was called the party line, which meant this. When the phone would ring in your house, that would be four or five houses on the same street, that when it rings in your house, it would ring in their house. We call that the party line. Before you made a call to anybody, one of the first things you had to ask was, anybody else on this line? Because we had uh, uh, peeping tomes in those days, just like we got peeping tomes in our day. When you pick up the phone, they would ease up the phone, and they would ease in your conversation. Well, that's the past. Now, that device is still around today. 
hear me carefully now, that device is still around today. But that device is limited. Notice the card on it. It had a plug in it. You had to plug it into the wall. In a lot of our homes, we had a long card on it that would stretch. Because we only had one phone per house. And mama got in your conversation. And your brothers and sisters got in your conversation. So we got a long card. So we can kind of get in another room and have those conversations. Uh, to some degree, I, I sure wish that bad boy was around today. So you can kind of hear what your kids are talking about uh, on the phone. But don't miss the preaching point here. That's a relic of the past. Now, it still operates. You, you can still make calls on that thing. All right. But you are limited in where you go uh, and to what degree you can conversate. And if you got fat fingers, you sure enough going to have a problem on that rotary phone. But I want you to watch this. This is where we are right now. Uh, yeah, I got one here. Uh, you, you have one. Some folk got two and three uh, of these deals. Uh, this is where technology is now. This is where technology is headed to in the future. Now, let me see if I can uh, uh, make this relevant to uh, the church. The local church is to be God's expression of his radical commitment to change. We got churches who just are just stuck in the past. We, we're not going to change our methodology. Our message does not need to change. Our message should not change. Our message should never change. But COVID has taught us some stuff. COVID has taught us that while your message does not change, your methods are going to have to change. What are you trying to say to us, preacher? Well, I, I, I'm going to show you what I'm trying to say to you in just a graphic or two here. I, I want you to watch this. God's ultimate goal for the church is not to follow cultural change like a water skier behind a boat. Uh, but to be the dynamic, catalytic community that brings change in a world that so desperately needs the God of change. So wait a minute, Brother Barclay. The uh, Bible said God does not change. No, God in his nature does not change. But God in his methods have changed. He does change. He changes all the time. We don't worship the way they worship in the Old Testament. But we worship. We don't offer animal sacrifices like they did in the Old Testament. But we do offer sacrifices. We offer ourselves as a living sacrifice to God. So God is not stuck in his methodology. methodology but too many of our churches are. Uh, are still rotary in a cellular world. For too long, the church has longed for the good old days. Has hoped that the future will simply be a detour to the past. Look at our national lectureships. Look at our college lectureships. Look at our gospel meetings. Look at our vacation Bible schools. Look at our education department. Same way it was 50 and 100 years ago. Friends, it's not that we are not biblical. That's not our issue. We're biblical. Our problem is we're not relevant. We are not keeping up with where the world is the educational system in our school system are far more advanced than are our educational systems in our congregations. If the pandemic has taught us anything, it should have taught us that we cannot and must not return the same way we left. One of my engineers up in the booth right now, uh, Marcus, said to me um, uh, months ago, uh, he, he said, Brother B, he said, uh, there are more than a billion people uh, plus on the Internet. Uh, during the time of the pandemic, I have preached to more people all across the world. 
The creativity of your preacher is being demonstrated now. You're having a revival virtually. Well, you don't have to fly me to Houston. But you're getting the same message as if I was standing there in your building and in your presence. That's creativity. People, there are a billion people out there. And during the pandemic, God has opened up doors whereby we can preach to thousands of more people than we can in the confines of our building. If the pandemic has taught us uh, anything, it should have taught us that we can't come back like we left. And maybe that was the plan of God all along. That the church has become too comfortable in the confines of his own facilities and buildings. And maybe God was trying to say to us, perhaps one of the things God was trying to say to us is, I need this gospel to go into all of the world, not just to McDonough, not just to the folks sitting inside of your building, because the church has become so, so lethargic, uh, so apathetic to evangelizing the world. And because we have, we spend most of our time trying to keep members happy rather than taking the mission and the message of God to the entirety of the world. See, it's like driving an automobile. If we spend too much time staring and glaring at what we ought to be glancing at, we will either hurt ourselves or somebody else. Now listen, um, you're going to get up in the morning or sometime during the day. Uh, and you're going to drive your car. Uh, and when you drive your car, uh, you have all kind of glass in that car. You have a, a side view mirror on the left. You got a side view mirror uh, on the right. You got a rear view mirror uh, in the top uh, of your car. Now, what are those mirrors designed to do? They are designed for you to glance back. The largest piece of glass in your car is your front window shield. Watch this, friend. When you look into the side view mirror, the left or the right, or even the rear view mirror, everything you see is already behind you. But the, uh, the designer of the automobile wants you to see, he wants you to glance back there. But he wants you to glare. He wants you to stare what's in front of you. See, the church has been so paralyzed and so enamored by our past, we always trying to preach like Brother Keeble preached. God bless Brother Keeble. God bless Brother Hogan. God bless Brother Winston. God, God bless uh, uh, the late Thomas Fawcett and, and all of these preachers that, that you and I both know and appreciate. But here's the reality. Those men preach in their own time. They preach in their own context. They use the gifts that God gave them at the time in which they lived in order to preach the message. Some of you will remember that in your gospel meeting, they had chalkboards. Some of you remember in the gospel meeting, they even had bed sheets up there where they put their lessons on a bed sheet. Well, I ain't got no bed sheet here. I got monitors here. <laughs> we, uh, we, we got uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars just like you of equipment here, uh, lighting here, because this is the time in which we live. Our message does not change, but we have to be relevant in our methodology to get our message out in the context of our time. Let's start staring ahead rather than staring backwards at the way we've always done it. Well, the way we've always done it had always worked. So why in the world would you want to go back to the rotary phone? We need to appreciate our past. We have historical Sunday here at our church because we don't want our folk to forget from whence we have come. But listen, uh, I tell our church all the time, uh, some of y'all uh, joined us uh, uh, after the train had left the station 
You, you, you were not there the first Sunday uh, our church got started a, a little over four years ago. We, we're, we're glad to have you. But we also want you to know we, we, we got a past. We preserve our past, but we do not live in our past. We embrace our present as we prepare our young people, as we prepare uh, our church for the future that is going to come. Now, let me say this to you. If, uh, if those of us uh, uh, who are leaders, and I'm talking to the leadership of your church now, if those of us who are leaders are looking for a safe place, if that's what you're looking for, if you're looking to have a ministry with no controversy, if you're looking for a, a, a ministry uh, with, uh, with no challenges, in fact, I, I just told our church yesterday, uh, Satan is busy. He's busy everywhere. But I reminded our church yesterday, at every new level, there's a new devil. Which means at every new level of growth and development for the church, there is a brand new challenge. Why in the world would Satan send a five-star demon to a one-star church? He ain't going to do that. He, he going to save that one. He wants you to get, he wants you to become a five-star church. Because he got a five-star demon waiting on you. So if those of us who are leaders are looking for the safe place, who, who's going to lead the church into the dangerous places? I, I just had a, our first Issachar conference here at our church. Uh, and uh, what do you mean Issachar conference? Well, I, I got the notion from 1 Chronicles 12, 32. And the children of Issachar, which were men that had understanding of the times, who knew what Israel ought to do. Friend, we need leaders in the church who understand the times. But you have to do more than just understand the times. You have to know what to do. That's one of the reasons I'm so impressed uh, with your, uh, your preacher, Lewis Parker. Uh, uh, not only does he work for the police department, he's a trained uh, 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 attorney. Uh, he brings a unique geek skill set. He's competent uh, in the word of God. Uh, he's in tune uh, with uh, his uh, generation. Uh, all of that's a blessing. And you need to support that kind of man and that kind uh, of ministry. How could we ever think the Christian faith would be safe? When his central metaphor is an instrument of death. Uh, perhaps behind me you see the cross on our wall. Uh, how can the church be? Uh, well, we don't want to get involved in controversy. We, you know, we, we, we don't want to uh, get involved in this. Uh, church ought to be dangerous. Uh, the people of God ought to be dangerous. Jesus said, uh, I'm going to build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The church is not on the defense. The church is on the offense. How could we ever think the Christian faith would be safe when its central image and metaphor is an instrument of death called the cross? It is not a coincidence that baptism is a watery grave illustrating death and resurrection. I wish I had hours on each one of these. It is no less significant that the ongoing ordinance of the Lord's Supper is a reminder of sacrifice. How did we ever develop a safe theology from such a dangerous faith? Friends, to live outside of God's will puts us in danger. To live in his will makes us dangerous and I want to be dangerous I don't want to offend folk I don't want to be insensitive uh, to folk but I tell you one thing whenever I get up in the morning I want the devil to say that rascal is up and I am in for a fight that needs to be the disposition of the people of God Everybody in the church is either, is either an armor bearer. Oh my goodness, I need two hours right here. Everybody in the church is either an armor bearer or you a pallbearer. 
What did you say, Dr. Barclay? I said, everybody in the church is either an armor bearer, you have picked up your armor to fight, or you have become a Paul bearer. I don't have time to explain all of this except to say uh, that the armor bearer is a soldier who assisted uh, with the carrying of the armor and the weaponry of other fighting soldiers. So we are either an armor bearer or we are a Paul bearer. And in too many of our churches, we are carrying the church to an early grave. Either we arm ourselves to fight the good fight of faith or we await the funeral to carry a dead church to his grave. Too many of our churches are already deceased. They're already dead. They just ain't been buried yet. I'm so grateful that the, the Stonecrest Church is not one of those churches, that the Sugar Land Church is not one uh, of those congregations. You've been vibrant and impactful in the Houston area for all of these many years. Now, let's take all of that now and apply it here to Ezra 10, uh, Ezra 3, uh, 10 through 13. Well, I want you to see something now. I want you to watch this. This passage describes a significant generational shift and a cultural crisis. The older priests and Levites and family heads wept when they saw the foundation of the temple. But the younger ones began to shout. Come up close and hear me, friends. And both generations were looking at the same foundation, but from different perspectives. Oh, my goodness. I feel like shouting right through here. Watch this, friend. Both generations were looking at the same foundation. But why did they see it so differently? Why is one crying? The other one shouting. Well, let me just ask you. Tell me what you see. I, I wish I could be in your building right now. and We're we going to have a whole lot of fun with this one. But, but tell me what you see. Uh, look at the statement and tell me what you see. Well, one of the things you see is this. God is now here. It's in the bold lettering. It's there. But look what else is there. God is nowhere. Watch this. Same statement. God is not here. Same statement. God is nowhere. Some of you saw one. Some of you saw the other. But then there's a third one up there. Say, no, no, no that's all up there. No, no, that, that's something else up there. Well, what else is up there? God, I snow here. Perhaps none of you saw that one. Most people don't see that one. But it's there. What's your point, uh, Dr. Barclay? Here's my point. You see things one way. I see things another way. What makes your way the right way? What makes your way the right way? You see, when it comes to methodology, uh, the way can be different. The perspective can be different. But the message must remain the same. How many times have I counseled a husband and a wife? He sees it his way. She sees it her way. They are on their way to a judge in a courthouse to get a divorce. And then they, they detour and come and see me. And I hear his perspective. I hear her perspective. And because they trust me, I give them my perspective so they don't have to hear the judge's perspective. For those of us who have been married uh, in a length of time, I know you can shout amen right through here. Uh, your wife doesn't always see things your way. Uh, all of my fellows are raising a thumb up in the booth. Uh, your wife doesn't always see things your way. Uh, 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 he may not see things your way. But guess what? You have learned how to stay married, haven't you? I've been married for 48 years, and, and we are as different in personality as night and day. Uh, I come from a single-parent household. She comes from both uh, a two-parent uh, household. Uh, I was taught uh, one way. She was taught another way, and those ways clashed when we first got married. 
we've known each other for 51 years. We've been married for 48 years. We met the first day of college. And in the midst of all of our differences, we have found a way to stay married and to stay uh, together. And it ought to be that way in the church. Now look at these two perspectives, and I will, I will bid you good day. What was the perspective of the anxious? Their perspective was a cry of sadness. Now, why were they crying? Let me give you some reasons. The reason the older priests and the family heads wept when they saw the foundation were these. Number one, the present temple was not going to look like the former temple. Oh, my goodness gracious. When they saw the foundation, uh, they said, oh, this new thing ain't going to look like that old thing, and we want that old thing. Well, here's the reality. They, they didn't have the money now to build that old thing. They had seen and experienced the splendor of the first temple built by Solomon. That's an artist's uh, depiction of what that temple looked like. You're talking about grandiose. You're talking about spectacular. Uh, it was a marvel of the ancient world. In fact, it had caused kings to stand in awe. Remember the queen of Sheba came and saw that, that marvelous place and said the half has never been told. It was an architectural marvel built from the wealth of Israel. But watch this. These folk had just come out of slavery. They broke. They ain't got no money. They don't have those kind of resources. And then watch this. The new temple would pale in its shadow. And those who could remember it could only weep. Isn't it amazing how we have so much awe and glory and respect for the good old days? But isn't it interesting? We only want the good old days in the church. We, we don't want the good old days where uh, you didn't have washing machines and, and inside plumbing. See, 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 no, 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 no. Oh, no. I'm glad that stuff is over. But see, we want the good old days in the church. And we don't understand uh, that the church uh, has to keep on changing in order to be relevant, not in his message. I need to be clear, not in his message, but in his methodology. If that was a tragedy, it lay in the fact that the former priest and family could not overcome their own sense of loss to celebrate what was now being passed on to their children. Oh, my goodness. May I ask this question? What is more important? We've kept our traditions, but we've lost our children. Hear carefully now the perspective of the younger. They were shouting for joy. You see, the younger generation had never seen the first temple. Just like some of our young kids today, they don't, they don't know what it is to go to segregated schools. Most of us went, uh, at least we started in segregated schools. Well, you know, for me, 1969, our schools integrated right there uh, in a little place 100 miles from where you live in Houston, Texas, called Woodville, Texas. We had two separate school systems, uh, uh, two separate water fountains by which we drank water out of. We had to go in the back of the cafe uh, in order to buy the same food uh, that white folk were eating inside uh, of the place. We had to uh, ride in the back of buses. Now, mind you, a lot of our young folk have never seen that. A and I'm grateful that they have not seen that. That says there's been progress. For the first time in the history of our nation, we've had an African-American president. I'm glad I lived to see that. And I'm glad our young people saw that. But it's not always been that way. The younger generation had never seen the first temple and had never stood in the middle of this majestic structure. Now, uh, well, that's my own indication that... Uh, I need to find a runaway here. That's what the new temple would have looked like. That's just an artist's depiction of it. Their lack of tears could be seen as an act of disrespect toward a loss of something so sacred. But in actuality, their celebration was sincere. Young people were celebrating because the foundation was a promise, oh my goodness, of a new place 
to meet with God. It didn't matter to them that it did not look like the first temple. They never saw it anyway. What was more important and what is more important, keeping our look or keeping our loyalty to God's purpose for why the temple was established. Now, what is more important to us? Again, we kept our traditions, but we've lost our children. One last thought, I'll bid you good day. What was the purpose of the temple? Well, at Exodus 25 and verse 8, when Moses had it erected uh, as a portable tabernacle in the wilderness, I want you to see what the purpose of that temple was. And let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. Friends, did you hear what I just said? The purpose of the temple, as God designed it, was to be a meeting place of God with the representative of his people. This is what I'm trying to say to you. Whether it be the rotary phone or whether it be the cellular phone, Come up real close and let me ask you this question. What, what is the purpose of a phone? Isn't it communication? Come on now. Isn't it communication? That's why the phone was designed to communicate. And whether you do it with your fingers in a rotary kind of way, or whether you do it with this, and one of these days, all you're going to need to do is, is put your skin and make a telephone call. What, what I'm saying to you is this. We always need to preserve our past. That's called history. But we also need to embrace the present. While, we, while the future either shapes us or we have a hand, in shaping the future. Now may the Lord of the harvest bless you and may he bless you real good. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour I need you. My one defense, my Righteousness, oh God, how I need you. Lord, I come, I confess, bowing here, I find my rest, and without you, I fall apart. You're the If there's anybody visiting with us, just wanted to re reiterate uh, the invitational call. Um, if, if, if you're here 
you're visiting, you want to be baptized, you come by hearing the message of salvation, the facts that Jesus died, he was buried, he rose again on the third day, believing that, repenting your sins, confessing, being buried in a watery grave of baptism. If you want to be baptized, just give us a call, 281-561-0881, or um, via email, info at slcoc.org, Lewis Parker at slcoc.org, that's myself, and um, we'll meet you at the church building and baptize you. If you're listening from afar, a different state, a different city, a different country, feel free to give us an email or a call, and we'll help locate a congregation that's nearest you. If you have any prayer requests, you could just um, uh, fill it in right now uh, on the Facebook live feed, and, and we'll get it on over to um, uh, everybody, uh, the ministers and elders, to pray. Uh, also, you can visit our website at slclc.org, and once you submit a prayer request through there, it automatically goes to the ministers and elders. Um, and so we'll, we'll pray for you. So thank you very much. Hello, my name is Brother Phillips. We're going to close out our night. Thank you, Brother Barclay, for those words of encouragement. And hopefully something's been said tonight to encourage you to become a Christian. Let us pray. Our Father, which art in heaven, once again, Father, we thank you for the preached word tonight, Lord. Continue to bless Brother Barclay and his, and his family, Lord, as he continues to preach the gospel, simple and understanding for anyone to understand. Thank you for the many blessings you stored on us, Lord, our health and our strength. Be with us as we conclude tonight, that we'll all come back tomorrow and be able to hear another portion of the gospel that can influence anyone to accept Christ as their Lord and Savior. This we ask in your son Jesus' name. Amen. God be with you. Be with you. Oh, God. God.